My name is Wolfgang Rauch. I'm a professor for urban water management at the University in Innsbruck, and that's actually a nice view at the town. Uh, and um, I'm very happy to be here, especially because I was given the opportunity to talk about my pet subject, and this is about modeling and uncertainty and failures and all these kind of things. I will try to make um, the, the, the arc to, to the topic here, which uh, we are talking about. Uh, but let me start with something personal in order to get the arc and get the, the topic. This is my daughter. Okay, and she loves animals, but she also made that her profession. So she is doing currently a PhD in veterinarian sciences. So why do I bring that up? Recently, she came to me with this data, and this is about seasonal variation of some cardiovascular uh, parameters in red here. Basically, it's blood pressure and something like this. And she had this nice theory, and that was her data. And when I have seen that, I had two conclusions to myself. The first one is an old saying, nothing is as tragic as a beautiful hypothesis killed by facts. And the second one, thanks God, I went in, out of the lab into the modeling world. This is what I'm doing now, a little bit nerdy. This is about uh, some new stuff which we're doing with smooth particle hydrodynamics, which is a sort of computational fluid dynamics thing. And it's about methane concentration in the anaerobic digester. And the real cool thing about that is actually that anaerobic digesters are so complicated to measure that you do not need to bother with calibration here. <laughs> but once in a while, Somebody comes up to you as a modeler and he tells you, well, Wolfgang, I do have a problem. I have a garage, 50 square meters. I need to do something about it. You have this nice model about blue-green infrastructure. So instead of going to the pipe, I want to do some green-blue infrastructure. But you're taking the responsibility. I don't want to have my basement flooded. And that's where you go usually in panic mode. Can I go back to the lab or do something? And that is actually what I would like to talk about, about, blood, about models, about uncertainty, about the responsibility, and also, in the end, a little bit about liability as an engineer. What is a model failure? Well, Richard Feynman, Nobel Prize winning physics person, he made the story really simple. He said, if it disagrees with an experiment, it's wrong. That's all what there, all there is to it. He was a physics person. He was not an engineer. For us, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, the question is, is that a model-based design failure? Mm. For the person sitting in the car there uh, with his ankle up in the rainwater, that's probably, he will say, yes, it was. But the question is, was it really? And now I have to go back into design 101, sorry, um, but I love these history things. That's Cathedral of St. Peter's Bowie. And uh, that's a very famous Gothic cathedral, and it collapsed in 1284. It collapsed 300 years later again, but uh, that was the first one. It was really a heavily investigated thing, and you can see why. Uh, on the right-hand side, you see the flying buttresses of this church, and you can already see how slim they are as compared to the other ones. But the really interesting thing was they dig into the design and there is, in the end, no evidence that there was any kind of cause relation between what they did, it, between the planning and what they actually made in the end. So it's just based on the gut feeling and the experience of the master builder. And if we turn that into design, it's a true trial and error design um, procedure where if we place it in, in normal structural engineering terms like stress and resistance, we have a system where the resistance is lower than the stress and it has to fall down. Okay, this is our bread and butter. When we have a deterministic model, then we can clearly separate these two things and we have a value for stress and resistance. Um, and we keep these two apart by a safety margin. So nice, everything fine. But all models are wrong. Some models are useful. Famous words of a famous statistician bo box. Uh, so everything 
in all our design, we have to cope with uncertainty. And this is why we have been introducing probabilistic design ages ago. Uh, and we are working with probability density functions of stress and resistance. And the key is to have uh, a measure of probability of the system failures. And that's where we go into risk-based design. Now, the comic has some true meaning because uh, for bigger structures we're actually working with frequencies of fatalities and this the fatality and the the, the notion of what can we or how we perceive a fatality is of course very different on a personal basis on a societal basis this is actually from uh, i think from the netherlands the uh, the acceptance level um now if we go further, we need to discuss briefly about the types of uncertainty. And uh, we have two, in, in modeling and uncertainty, we have two big dis uh, differences. The one is the aleatory uncertainty, which is actually due to inherent or natural variability of phenomena. And the other one is epistemic, uh, which arises from the lack of knowledge. So the first one would be the uncertainty and the variability of rain, in our case, for example. And the second one could be, for example, uh, the uncertainty which stems from uh, parameters and not knowing the true value of a parameter. Now, this was discussed very heavily by very different authors and very differently. If you see, for example, famous uh, hydrologist Baven, uh, in a recent paper, he actually restricts aleatory uncertainty to stationary statistical variation, which would mean that not even climate change effect to rain would be included in here because that is, as we heard in the morning, is non-stationary. Stationarity is dead. So um, it's a very heavily discussed notion, but um, we can still use uh, the aleatory or the discrimination between aleatory and epistemic uncertainty. And um, where it has been used quite heavily is in hydrological design where we take into account the natural variability either of rain or also of the failure of the system, flood, for example, um, and uh, express our design as we have before with respect to return periods. But this is not a true probabilistic design because what we are doing is still, from the modeling part of view, it's still deterministic. And these two things has to be kept in mind. If we introduce here also the modeling uncertainty, we introduce here a level which is not taken care of in this design procedure. And the other thing is, uh, this is extreme statistics. And uh, if we have low frequency event, uh, either rain and even worse with floods, then we can we have a hard time to actually give them the true value for the return period. It's not that easy because these effects are appearing quite seldom, which means we have a high uncertainty for post-evaluation in after an event. And we can always argue, was this a 10-year event or was that a 12-year event or 15-year event? And there's huge uncertainty there. And that usually helps as an engineer because we can normally claim, well, my design is correct because to my understanding that was a 10-year event and not a 15 or the other way around. So this is something which helps us a bit. Now, coming back to my question before, was that a failure of the model? No, it was a very plain design failure and there was no, no way out. The rain event was about a 500 year rain event and the design was up to about one in 10 years. So that was very clear uh, that even taking uncertainties into account that this had to be happen uh, and had nothing to do with the model failing. The model we can still discuss if the model failed. Um, the model was uncertain, but it predicted floods correctly, so it's not completely wrong. So, sources of uncertainty. I'm a bit fond of history, so I was searching for the original introduction of this field, and that I found for an 
with an econ economist, Martin Schubig. Uh, he was the first one to talk about various sources. And I simply do not have the time to run through everything, but um, just uh, a few things. It's um, the first discrimination you can make is about risk, so including. Uh, as a source of uncertainty, uh, which denotes statistical uncertainty, probabilities that you can apply. And a lot of discussion in the literature is found about measurement errors, even more for parameter uncertainty. But something which is hardly ever discussed is hardware resilience. And I just wanted to give you one slide. Um, so we have to see that there is some influence of electrical and magnetic um, waves on our mainframe and motherboard system. And uh, this causes bit flips. And the bit flips, depending on where they appear, can have quite a significant effect. So I have here in an 8-bit representation, if you have a bit flip, on the second bit, then it changes quite a lot, the value. Um, if you have it in the other place, it might not be of any influence. But anyway, uh, depending on where it is, you have a certain probability of an error, and it's about 1% per day for a normal machine. Uh, so if you want to do something really, truly important simulation where you not want to have any kind of error, you better invest in good hardware. There are, of course, this error correcting code memory things but and other things. And the second thing, you should avoid to make really sensitive calculations on the plane. If you are somewhere up at 10,000 meters, there you have a higher chance something goes wrong. Second thing, uh, ignorance beyond statistics if the functional relations are unknown, if you don't know if it's an elephant or a mouse. Again, software, uh, the model structure uncertainty has been heavily discussed in the literature. I want to do the, just to make a small thing for the uh, second part, uh, the other thing that is a software error. And the poster, the poster example of that was the Mars climate orbiter crash in 1999, where this uh, orbit, uh, orbiter was crashing into the Mars atmosphere and burned. Uh, the whole thing cost about 330 million US dollars. And the, the problem was a rather plain one. Uh, they forgot that they need to have a conversion between the metric system and the English system. That was really the, the error here. Um, it is a significant problem in security um, and also in economy. The US, they are sort of estimating about 60 billion annual loss because of software problems and software errors. There is no bug-free software. So the, the industry average is about 10 to 50 bucks in 1,000 code lines. And even if you really have very, very good uh, tested commercial software, you still find some bugs. The worst thing is probably a PhD code. Yeah. So beware if you really use complex codes untested. Indeterminacy, total ignorance, unknown unknowns. Again, a very big problem because we really don't know anything about it. There are different aspects and different views on that. Baven, the hydrologist, said those we do not have to worry about until for whatever reason they are recognized as issues and become known unknowns. And he's certainly correct from a statistician point of view, from a hydrologist point of view. But if we have something like him showing up and we don't know before that he will come. If we consider the effect he had on the environment, it's definitely something we should at least discuss beforehand about and uh, really take into account that something like this could happen. It's, it's really important. Okay, so these are normal model errors. But there's something we are hardly ever talking about, and this is inappropriate use of models, and it's basically human error. Um, there are many, many examples. I just bring three, running out of time. Um, in our field, um, one of them is about sensor placement. 
That is a story from my early days. We made an estimate um, uh, for, um, yeah, it was basically a, a simulation uh, for a city, flood frequencies, and uh, we compared different time series of rain sensors, and then we found that one of them was consistently giving less extreme events. Then we went into the whole problem and it was actually a rain sensor which was placed in a convent and the people there were very fond of their garden and they planted the tree right next to it and by time this tree was growing and growing and overshadowing this uh, sensor and of course nobody informed anybody so you better check your sensors before you take these things into account. This is a classic one. Um, what do we, or inappropriate calibration, does calibration cover all our functional relations? So if we really want to go and simulate uh, the effect of flooding, uh, then we are in a low frequency area, um, return periods 10 years and higher. And uh, there the pervious area definitely has a huge impact. Our, design, our calibration we are making in the high frequency area because we have a hard time to wait for 10 years statistically to find the, 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 the calibration event. So we usually make that in this in one year and try to find three to five rain events which fit. But then we are calibrating all the rest, but never the pervious area. Yeah? So which means for what we want to have, we are running here fully blind with a non-calibrated model. Um, this is also a nice thing, this regarding numerical issues. This is very common nowadays because everybody thinks um, this software is running so very good and it looks so nice, you just press the button, everything is fine and covered. But inherent, it's numerical solution procedures and there are a few basic facts and one of them is, uh, for example, that you cannot simply do whatever you want with the spacing, time and um, time and your location because there are criteria, that's one of them, current criteria, where you have a relation between your wave velocity and the spacing. Which means, if you take just a sewer system as you know it, and you find some pipe lengths which are less than one meter, and you just place it into your model, then you basically force the model to extremely small time steps. If the model can handle it, yeah, some models cannot and then you have a failure anyway. At best, you have a very slow model. So somebody really should know a little bit about the numerical solution procedures, otherwise these things coming up. So um, I would like to make a short detour to um, uh, the problem here uh, about changing paradigms. Okay. Um, no, it's, that's correct. Okay. We made, uh, or we are just doing a, um, a research which has to do with the double effect of, of um, climate change adaptation and mitigation of urban heat island effects. And uh, we do definitely see a an sharp increase of extreme heat days per year. Uh, and um, for us, even here in Lund, that's probably more a nuisance than a problem, but uh, in other places it's definitely a huge problem and it can lead to really inhabitable urban environments. So um, the other thing is really that the whole notion of uh, climate change and investing in blue-green infrastructure at the moment in Austria is largely driven by, hum by the heat, uh, urban heat island effect. So this is really something which pushes a lot of the discussion. So um, not going into details, we have a nice methodology where we take color infrared um, 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 GIS data and we use a normalized difference vegetation index um, in order to find what kind of vegetation and what kind of land cover we have. And in the end we have these nice maps for, this is the case study of Innsbruck, where you find all kind of urban land use and, and um, index and uh, vegetation index. And then you can use this with a very simple model 
which just takes the surface area and attributes some t maximum temperature to it, then you can identify um, sort of maximum surface temperatures, which then is capable or we are capable to make some hotspot evaluation, which is nice because then we can actually go and place blue-green infrastructure into it and uh, look at different locations and then we can check for the effect on the surface temperature and then also make the deterministic simulation with flood frequency and come up to a conclusion. So, we presented this stuff to the, uni to the municipality in Innsbruck and um, they have been very interested and they will place some small-scale installations in a few places. This is very nice. The other thing is we have about 2% of our roof systems are green, green roofs. So when we are talking about changing paradigms, I'm not talking about increasing from 2% to 3% or to 4%. Uh, it's, even, it's, it's quite a lot, but the changing paradigm means I really changed something. And my question when we discussed that to myself and to my co-workers was, do we actually dare to go to the municipality and tell them you have to spend hundreds of millions uh, and implement blue-green infrastructure and we are solving your problem? Tough question. Uh? With all the uncertainties, because for example we are not using here a model for wind, completely missing, uh, many other uncertainties, we are well aware. But now how do we as engineer act on that? How can we actually in our design do that? Now I, that was a really interesting story in the beginning uh, by Steve about adaptive solutions. I was asking myself, um, is our current system up to that? And um, maybe from another point of view, first question, can society expect fail-proof engineering? Well, we have to tell them, no, there is no exact science for deterministic calculations. This has been proven by so many people. It's not working. And uh, in the, the falsification concept of Popper, is simply not applicable in engineering because if we have an advance of technology, we cannot simply falsify it, uh, at least not in a big scale. In small scale, yes, but uh, not, not for changing paradigm situations. Second thing, yes, we have been discussing about moral and engineering ethics. Definitely, it's engineering ethics to tell municipality you should do that. But there's also the notion of responsibility in terms of liability as a concept of law. Huh? Somebody is held liable if we are failing or if the system fails. If we have 100 million euro going down the drain, somebody has to take the responsibility. Um, engineers, there are different views to that and it's a long story, but engineers, they use normally a control system as guidelines and code of practice because that's sort of a, a balance between not stopping technology advance completely, but it's also not really promoting it. And that's how, that's how we're working with these systems. Yeah? There might be better systems, but that's what we usually have at the moment. And the last thing is, how to cope with uncertainty? Well, in the daily life, an engineer can only cope with it if it's covered by safety factors yeah, or if it's part of the design. Otherwise, an engineer definitely has a problem to deal with probabilities and uncertainties. Again, because it's a question of responsibility and liability. We probably will hear more uh, about <laughs> coping with uncertainty in decision support systems. There are many uh, new developments in the last decade, adaptive pathways, real options and so on. They are not part of a formal design process. Uh, they are helpful, but it's, if it's an engineer, if I'm, if I'm plan planning um, uh, a solution, then I have to deal with that and I have to take into account how to handle uncertainties. Okay, final thoughts, my three points here. There is no exact science and in our design and in models we have to cope with uncertainty and probability. The 
thing which we not taking into account very often is inappropriate use of models and human error in, in general. And this is significant and we are usually neglecting it, but we should take it into account also. And the last thing is if we talk about climate change, uh, uh, sorry, paradigm shifting solutions in our climate change environment, then we also have to discuss at some point responsibility and liability for engineering solutions. Thank you. Wow, that's a lot of things to take in, Wolfgang. <laughs> we have to think about that. We have a lot of questions. Gustav? Thank you, Wolfgang, for very interesting uh, points of view. Uh, I have a question concerning how do we compare you know, different kinds of responsibilities. Let's say we have the traditional one having a safety factor of, let's say, three, or we declare this is the uncertain in terms of the risk percentage or something like that based on probability density functions. How do we deal with the responsibility that we present for decision makers? Because sooner or later they may have to make a decision, even if it's based on very incomplete knowledge and models. Would be interesting to listen to your... Uh, <laughs> uh, difficult. <laughs> uh, I think... Yeah, yeah. Probably, may, maybe also you have a good answer from your side, but uh, um, I think... Uh, we, we are shifting in that respect the, the problem and the responsibility, the responsibility a bit back to the to the to the problem owner, so to speak. Yeah, and uh, we are providing in that case a lot of probabilities, and then we we are coming and hand the whole thing over. Now you take a decision, and we are telling you there is a certain probability of failure, and uh, in in a way. The safety factors we can handle yeah, as, as engineers, because there is again the code of practice and everything, and if I do everything correct, then, 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 well, I should do everything correct. There are famous errors and famous problems uh, where, where this has not happened, but if uh, it's a sort of a safe procedure for an engineer. And the other thing is the engineer never can take up a huge solution and take the, 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 the probability on his own uh, responsibility and liability. So we will always try to hand on uh, this to the, to the problem owner, basically. I think the, if, if society has a sort of a notion how much uh, risk can be acceptable and uh, this example which I showed for, for uh, big structures uh, from the Netherlands does pretty much that. Uh, then there is a, a way how to cope with these uh, yeah, probabilities and the formal way that we can go forward. All other things, I think, are damn complicated. I think it's then simply an, um, a thing about discussing with uh, politicians and how to cope with these things. I would, uh, I would think, in my my own perception, in the European context, you will never get anything done. Uh, in a Chinese context, they probably will simply build the thing. Uh, um, <laughs> I think that's that as much as I can give you answer in five minutes without thinking for two days. If I just may uh, add a little comment. Uh, I'm comparing this with the discussion on nuclear reactor safety. And you know, you said, okay, now we have one risk in 1,000, and now we have made it better, so it's only one risk in one million. And so many people said, well, it's still one too much. So, how do we communicate that kind of uh, uncertainty and uh, say we can never get zero happening, uh, zero events in? Yeah, I think it's uh, it's a little bit the the whole. I th the, the one, one thing which is quite interesting to see actually is also it, it's described in this new book by, by Fur uh, about the weather, we make weather, um, about the climate change. And it's quite interesting to read that uh, we do know all these problems and we know 
how climate change inevitably in the end will affect us and how much will go down the drain, but we still are unable to, to, to react to it. Yeah? And I think this, this, climate change, uh, the, this discussion also is a little bit, in, in our context, is a little bit reflecting to that. So now we, are, we have this problem, like nuclear uh, stations or, or like uh, our need for paradigm shift. And then we are discussing, okay, how many fatalities or how much money do we put at risk? And what do we have at stake? And I think in, in our democratic world where where we have uh, many everybody has a say into it yeah and you have huge amount of stakeholders and um, I'm, I'm totally fan of well democracy is, is just no doubt uh, no, no, nothing to discuss here yeah please but the the shortcoming is if you have a discussion um, procedure in the end you will you will have a hard time to 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 really find a negotiation you had a nice example that you found something where you had uh, your native tribe where they they found the solution but uh, it's it's usually very complicated to to have a solution unless you really have a procedure and the procedure must be that we have probabilities and we have an acceptable range of Sure of, of, of risk and we have a non-acceptable risk area. And if we have argued on that and if the society has sort of placed that somewhere, then we can work with it. All other things I think are, are very complicated, but maybe you have a better view. One, one, tiny, one, tiny, one, tiny. one tiny addition. And we need decision makers that are willing to take that risk because that is the difference between West Western Europe at the moment and China, as you yeah. said, uh, because whatever we do, uh, whether we can calculate that safety of the nuclear reactor to uh, 0 0.1 to the, to, the, to, the, to the minus six, that's fine. But it's about willing to accept that risk and to take a decision despite the uncertainty. Uh, it's a long time ago that I had a discussion with one of the, the political leaders in the country. And, and one of the things he said, well, Frans, uh, we were talking about the need for uncertainty information. And he said, well, France, be aware, we are elected to take decisions under uncertainty. Mm -hmm. So, so if, if you, okay, tell me what uncertainty, what you, what you can tell me about uncertainty, but, uh, and, and we, are, we know there are unknown unknowns, yet it's my responsibility as an elected person to take a decision. And I think it is the, the lack of courage of our current decision makers that, that, that hampers us in, in, in making progress. Mm -hmm. So it is not only up to us to improve our, our procedure, it's also up to the decision maker to simply decide in uncertainty. One more question. Was I good? Um, so I just have to comment on this. All policy making, I would say, is made under uncertainty, more or less. So, but I also agree. Uh, I w wanted to ask, uh, connected to this then, uh, you said you uh, communicated with the municipality. In what way or how do you communicate uncertainty? Is it only in terms of probability or are you also communicating what, how certain you are about these probabilities? Oh, oh. Very important uh, if very, we talk about very, uncertainty, right? Okay, I can give you um, a nice elaborate academic answer and I give you my personal answer, which is the guy who is major of the city of Innsbruck is from the Green Party and he's a friend of mine. <laughs> so I tell him, well, I'm very uncertain, but I think you should do that. And he wants to have a green example and that's why we sort of figure out we can do small steps. <laughs> that's my communication there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.